Hi, so today we're going to discuss observing emission and absorption lines in an astronomical context. So suppose I have a galaxy back here which is emitting a whole bunch of different kinds of photons. Some of them might be blue in color, some of them might be red in color, some of them might be green in color. So the basic idea here is I have some kind of a backlight that emits photons at a whole range of colors or frequencies. So in astronomy we often call these continuum sources. And a continuum source means that if I were going to plot the emission coming out of them as a function of frequency, that they have emission at a whole range of frequencies. And this is in contrast to something like an atom, which may emit or absorb only at particular frequencies. So let's say we have a continuum source, and let's say we have a telescope over here that we're looking through with our eye. Now as these photons come to our telescope, we can measure the spectrum of received emission. So we can graph the intensity of what we observe versus frequency. Now for a continuum source, this is pretty straightforward. We should just reproduce the original spectrum that was emitted. But now let's suppose that we have a cloud of gas that these photons go through on their way to us. So we'll call this our intervening cloud of gas. And let's assume for now that this is a cold gas cloud, which means that any atoms that are inside this cloud are probably in unexcited energy states, which means that when a photon comes along with the right energy, it can excite one of these atoms to an excited state. And let's say these atoms have an energy transition that prefers to absorb red light. So the green colored light from our, our background source manages to get through just fine without scattering, as does the blue photon. But the red photon, as it's coming in here, gets absorbed by an atom, which then becomes excited. Now all excited energy states are inherently unstable, and so eventually this atom is going to decay back into the unexcited state, and it's going to re release this photon again. But once this atom has absorbed this photon and bounced around with it a little bit, it may emit this photon in any direction at all that it chooses. So it may end up sending this photon off this direction, and so it doesn't end up finding its way into our telescope. And this is the principle behind an absorption line, which is that we have a whole continuum backlight of sources, so we have emission at a whole range of frequencies, but at one particular frequency over here, some intervening medium like a cloud can absorb those kinds of photons and scatter them off in different directions, and we don't end up getting the light at that frequency. And so the spectrum that we end up measuring agrees with our continuum spectrum, but then we have a missing set of photons that are associated with the transition of an atom inside of this intervening cloud. And just to round things out here, we can also talk about emission lines, where maybe we have another cloud here, but this time it's hot, which means that the atoms inside of this cloud, which may emit at some different frequency, because maybe they're a different kind of atom, tend to be in the excited state already. And why do they tend to be in the excited state? Well, maybe they're getting energy pumped in from some nearby uh, other source of photons, like maybe there's a nearby star over here that's radiating photons in and pumping up these atoms into their excited energy states. So as before, these excited energy states are unstable, and that means that they will decay and let out photons in any old direction. But every time they decay and go into the unexcited state, new photons are getting pumped in from this star over here, which keeps driving them up into the excited state. So then a whole bunch of photons come out of this cloud because it's hot now, and these decays are happening all the time, and some of these photons that are coming out just happen to be pointed in the right direction to enter into our telescope. So that by the time this light gets over to our telescope, we have our green photons, which went through unimpeded, we don't have any red photons because they were scattered off of the previous cloud, but then we have an excess of these blue photons because some extra ones got pumped in from this cloud, which was drawing energy from this nearby star over here. So then the spectra that we end up measuring will have extra photons coming in at the frequency corresponding to the blue light, the blue transition that we had here. So in general, we see emission and absorption lines laid over a continuum background that we're looking at. And other than the fact that absorption lines remove photons from the continuum and emission lines add photons to the continuum, 
these two processes are very similar in terms of how they affect our spectra. So now let's look a little more closely at exactly what's going on near an absorption or emission line. And just to make things more definite, we're going to assume for now that these are all absorption lines. So we have some continuum in the background. Where we're zooming in on one of these lines now. The background continuum has almost no features in it, and we're looking in detail at what's happening at a particular absorption line. So now that we've zoomed in on one particular feature in the spectrum, I want to start talking about what's happening at all of these different frequencies across here, and why is it that at some frequencies we absorb almost all of the photons here, while at other frequencies we maybe only pick up a few of the photons on their way through. So I'm going to recolor the spectrum a little bit so that we can use colors to talk about the different frequencies here. So I'll talk about this over here is the purple side of our emission line. Over here is the blue side of our emission line. Then maybe we have the green part of our emission line, which is right in the center of the line, followed by yellow, followed by orange or red. So now just to be clear, we have one cloud that we're talking about here, where all these different photons are coming in, at all the different colors. And we have, let's say, one type of atom here with just one kind of transition that can go from a ground state here into an excited state and then back down again. Now as we've talked about in the context of line profile functions, there's an energy difference between the upper and lower energy states of this atom. And that energy difference is equal to h nu zero, where nu zero is the frequency of the photon emitted at the center of the line. So this is nu zero right over here. But for a variety of reasons, these atoms can actually absorb photons at slightly different frequencies. And some of those reasons were because of the, the natural width of the line, which has to do with how stable the transition is, or Doppler broadening, and the final thing, which we won't really get into, is collisional broadening. But all of these effects mean that around the center of the line, as a function of frequency, an atom can, with some probability, absorb photons at other energies. So it's most probable, if you send in a photon at exactly the center frequency of this line, that the atom will absorb that photon. But if you send a photon with a frequency out in the wings of that line profile function, the atom will, with some probability, still absorb that photon. It's just not as likely. So then we can ask, well, how many atoms are between us and the photons on the other side of this gas cloud as we look through it with our telescope here? So as these photons go through this cloud on their way to us, how many atoms do they cross? And it turns out that your answer is going to depend both on how deep your cloud is here, how far it had to go through, the density of the atoms inside that cloud, were there a whole bunch of atoms or were they very widely spaced, and also the probability that a photon hits an atom. So let's assign some variables here. Let's call this distance through the cloud s. Let's call the density of atoms n, where n is supposed to be the number density, so it's the, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter. And then this probability that a photon hits an atom well, that's sometimes called the cross-section for interaction, and we'll use a sigma to denote that. We'll put a little nu under here to show that this cross-section might depend on frequency, and this has units of, of area. It's a cross-sectional area for these photons to hit an atom, so this has units of centimeters squared. So then, as we've discussed in the video on optical depth, the number of photons that make it through this cloud are proportional to e to the minus tau, where tau is the optical depth, and is essentially the average number of atoms that a photon would collide with on its way through the cloud to us. And we can compute that as the number density of atoms times the cross-section for interaction times the distance through the cloud. And as you can see, the units come out to be unitless, that we have one over centimeters cubed here in n, times centimeters squared here in the cross-sectional area times the distance in centimeters. So all the units cancel out and the optical depth is a unitless quantity. Now the number of atoms obviously doesn't depend on frequency here and the distance through the cloud obviously doesn't depend on frequency. So the only parameter here that really depends on frequency that determines whether 
a photon gets absorbed or not as a function of frequency is this cross-sectional area. And we could actually pick this cross-sectional area as a function of frequency. We can express that as the product of two things. We could express it as the cross-sectional area at line center. So it's the probability you get absorbed right here at line center times whatever variation is a function of frequency there is in the probability that you get absorbed. So this line profile function phi. So now we've encapsulated all of our frequency dependence in this one function here, this line profile function, which we could calculate as coming from natural, the natural line width or Doppler broadening or potentially collisional broadening. So because it's so common, let's talk a little bit more about Doppler broadening. The fact is, some of the atoms in this cloud may be moving, and they may be moving in different directions. And it may be that they're moving just because of the thermal motion of atoms in this cloud, or it may be that there's some rotation or movement of this cloud that actually results in some bulk flow of these atoms. So let's assume that this cloud is spinning so that these various atoms are all moving around in a circle here. Now an atom at rest will absorb naturally at say the, the frequency corresponding to the green color here because that's at the center of our line. So that atom will happily absorb this green photon coming in from our continuum background. But what about an atom that's moving towards our continuum background? Let's say this atom over here. Now this atom naturally absorbs green photons. However, because it's moving towards the source of these photons, photons that come to it appear blue shifted. So this orange photon here in the rest frame of this atom looks green, and that atom would happily absorb that photon. So some number of atoms here that are moving towards the source of the photons, and remember, if the atom is moving in some diagonal direction, it's only the component of the velocity that's pointing towards the photon that actually is involved in the Doppler shifting of the photons, then these atoms are able to better absorb those photons at lower frequencies. Now similarly, there may be atoms that are moving away from the source of photons here. And that means as a photon comes in, perhaps a blue photon, it gets red shifted because this, in the rest frame of this atom, it's running away from those photons and the wavelength gets stretched. And so these blue photons may, in the rest frame of this atom, or this one over here that's moving partially in that direction, appear to be a green photon that can be easily absorbed. And for atoms that are moving perpendicular to the direction of the photons coming in, there is no Doppler shift, and so they still appear to absorb photons at their natural frequency. And again, the degree to which the velocities of these atoms points along the direction that these photons are coming in, their rest frequencies will be Doppler shifted by a corresponding amount. So now we see that out of the total population of atoms here, we've subdivided them in by color depending on how they were moving. And that means that in the spectrum that we're observing from the background source as a function of frequency, instead of absorbing all at one frequency as they would if they were all at rest, they, they would absorb in a narrow profile centered at their natural center frequency here, mu zero, that instead they get spread out. And so some fraction of atoms will absorb at a lower frequency. A potentially higher fraction of atoms will absorb as we get closer to the center frequency where there are more atoms of that velocity moving around in the cloud. And then finally, we'll see some number of them actually at the center line frequency, but not as many because every atom whose velocity moves it to a, absorb at a different frequency moves it away from the center frequency so it can no longer absorb at that center frequency. So one consequence of the spread in velocities of the atoms in this cloud is that we never have a very high optical depth at any one frequency here, which is to say that the optical de depth decreases at line center. And just to finish things up here, on the bluer side we have some atoms there that can absorb there and then the highest velocity ones may absorb here. Now the way I've drawn this cloud with some atoms blue shifting and some atoms red shifting, we get this nice symmetric distribution. But in general, depending on where we look through this cloud, suppose we only looked through this side of the cloud right here with our telescope, we only look through this side of the cloud, we would only see 
the blue shifted side of the velocity profile of the atoms in this cloud. And therefore, we may not actually see a symmetric absorption profile. It may be skewed off in one direction, so that the absorption profile we actually measure there may be skewed down in this direction here. So interestingly, you can use the absorption profile of the atoms in a gas cloud to determine something about the properties of that gas cloud. And that may be their bulk motion if they're all moving at some velocity, or if you see the frequency at the center of the line shift depending on which direction you're looking through this cloud, you may be able to determine that the cloud is rotating. And also, you can use the, the width of these lines here to tell you something about the temperature. So the width can depend on temperature. So as you can see, there are a lot of things we can learn from absorption and emission lines. We can learn things about the, the velocity of atoms in the clouds, which could be from bulk flow or rotation. We can learn about the density of that cloud and possibly the, the size because both of those things determine how deep these absorption lines are. You can learn about the temperature, and depending on where absorption lines are, you can also learn about what atoms are in the cloud, so the composition. And depending on whether you have absorption and emission or emission lines, you can also learn about the excitation state of that cloud. So there's a whole wealth of interesting information embedded in the spectra that you can measure relative to a background continuum source. And that's why astronomers use spectral lines quite frequently to study our surrounding universe. So thanks for listening to this video on spectral lines.